make the darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus You silence fear Jesus, Jesus You make the darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus
Uh, so we've been in a series uh, from the Alpha series, but we're going to um, skip that today. Uh, Pastor John will continue with it next week. Uh, today we're going to do a little bit of a different sermon. You can see it up there. So I'm going to start with this question. Have you ever been really, really, really thirsty? Like, you know, like you just ate a whole bag of chilies, thirsty. Or a, a really hot curry, thirsty. You know those times when you just need to pour uh, a bucket of milk down your throat? Have we ever, have, has anyone ever been in, have you, has anyone ever been in a place where they were so thirsty they would drink from like a dirty puddle of water. Probably unlikely in this crowd, but maybe. Maybe some of us have been in... Matt, you ever been in that survival situation? Or Yeah, Matt. Matt would. I knew Matt would. Probably not many of us else, though, have ever been in that space where we've really ever experienced being that thirsty. And the truth is, is that thirst isn't something that you can fake. It's not something that you can actually manufacture. You're either thirsty or you're not thirsty. Um, We know that with little kids, those of us who have had little kids. You can try and make them drink and they won't, or they will scream the house down because they are dying and they need to have a glass of water. If you're an actor, you can try and portray someone who's thirsty. If you're a good actor, maybe we'll believe you. Um, I think of Tom Hanks in Castaway. How many of us know Castaway the movie? He's stranded on a desert island and he, there's no fresh water and eventually he cracks open a coconut and I believe him in that scene that he's really, really thirsty, even though Tom Hanks probably wasn't dying himself. Real thirst, though, it's something that is just completely impossible to fake. Because we all see through it, don't we? We all just, we see through bad acting. But it's definitely the same the other way as well. Um, If you really are physically dehydrated, then you can't pretend that you're not. (laughs) If you're really physically dehydrated, you cannot pretend that you're not. In fact, it's very provable because if you go for three to four days without water, what happens? (laughs) <laughs> you die. <laughs> it's very provable. You can't fake that one. If you go for three or four days without water, you die. There's a survival rule of three. It's um, three minutes without oxygen. If, if you go longer than three minutes without oxygen, you'll die. If you go longer than three days without water, you'll die. If you go longer than three weeks without food, you'll die. I reckon I could pull off three months, Debbie, without food. <laughs> and one minute without oxygen, that's, uh, that's me. So it's funny, church, how much, as Christians, we can sometimes try and fake thirst, isn't it? I think we're all going to nod to ourselves. We all like to appear to be spiritually thirsty for God. We all prefer to appear that way. And we do not like to appear to anyone, even to ourselves, as though we are spiritually thirsty and dry. We pass ourselves off as being very full or even overflowing, and we try to look as fully hydrated uh, even when sometimes we're running on empty. Imagine, church, if we could all actually be honest with ourselves and with each other and really own the times that we are feeling dry. And so that's my question I want to place before us as we begin this morning, is where are you at? church. Where are you at personally? Because the thirst can't be faked and God will always know uh, anyway. But how thirsty are we together for the living water of the Holy Spirit? And it's actually, it's pretty hard to ask yourself this honestly. Are you really full and overflowing? And I hope that some of us are. I believe that some of us are there. Um, But I suspect that some of us, or maybe even many of us, are feeling uh, 
that we're actually a little bit dry, that we are actually um, a little bit spiritually dehydrated. And so that's the question I want us to keep in our minds this morning, church. Are you thirsty? And it's my opinion that most churches in Australia and in many parts of the world today are actually deeply spiritually dehydrated. Do you, am I alone in that feeling, church? Maybe I'm just a negative Nancy. And <laughs> but I think, I think from the people I've talked to that there's a general opinion that the church is not doing that well in Australia. And it's not dead, but in general, we've seen better days. It feels like it's going through this very, very dry spell. Uh, it's like we're parched and we're dusty and we're lifeless. Uh, and it feels to me like the Spirit of God has flown, has been able to flow better at other times in, our, you know, in all of our living history. We've all, I think, if you've been a Christian for a little while, I think we've all seen God flowing more than we do at the moment. He's not not flowing. Um, but I, I just, I want to be really honest, church, and um, it feels to me like even some of the churches that are claiming to be filled with the Spirit and flowing with the Spirit, it's kind of bad acting for me. I want to be really honest on that. I've, like, I don't know, if you guys have been able to travel around and be part of other churches... Um, Debbie and I in our last couple of years have done a lot of travelling and visiting other churches and I've been looking for a church that's full, that's overflowing and I just feel like hmm, even the ones that appear like they are I'm not convinced I'm not, they're not doing a Tom Hanks level of it I'm, I'm not convinced uh, yeah I just haven't found one when I became a Christian, it was in the early 90s, uh, the Holy Spirit did seem to be flowing a lot more um, back then. Most churches that I knew of, and I was new to church, and I was going to lots of different denominations in that, um, most of them back then had morning and evening services that were really full, that were really packed. And it didn't matter what church. It was, well, I ended up in an AOG church, an ACC church, but it, at that time... I was going to all these different churches in Ipswich. They were, you know, Pentecostal churches, Baptist, Methodist churches. They all had morning and evening services, and they were all full. They were all every week packed with people, and the Spirit was moving in a, in a lot of them. Uh, at my AOG church, there was an altar ministry every Sunday night. There were people being, being aware of the Spirit's presence and being ministered to by the Spirit Every single Sunday night, it was just, it was uncommon if God wasn't moving amongst us. There was a, a tangible awareness of his presence. He was just, he was there. Uh, and I would drag my non-Christian friends along because um, I was just newly converted. And they would know, there was, they would know that this was different. This was something unusual. You know, there was, God was in the house. They knew that. They just felt, they felt his presence as well. But I feel like if I was to drag non-Christian friends to churches with me, I think they'd be bored. <laughs> because I feel bored in churches. Even in, and I'm, gonna, I'm glad Pastor John's not here today. <laughs> because I'm going to confess and I'm going to uh, address that I feel bored coming to church. Not every Sunday, but a lot of Sundays. I feel bored. And it's got nothing to do with the team or with Pastor John. You guys are all doing a great job. It's got everything to do with me coming dehydrated. Coming to church dehydrated and I'm not really coming with a desire to drink. It's, it's part of the, it's, it's the catch-22. It's the problem of being dehydrated. You don't necessarily want to drink. And so I come to church every Sunday and the drink's on offer, but I don't drink and I go home just as dehydrated as I was when I came. And it is the funny thing about dehydration because you don't know that you're thirsty. 
You don't actually, when you get dehydrated, you don't even know that you're thirsty. You don't even know you're supposed to drink until it's almost too late. Where are you at today, church? How thirsty are you, are we, for the Spirit of God? So this isn't a situation that's unique to our time. In the Bible, we see that God's people often do go dry. You know, there's a saying that we are filled with the Holy Spirit, but we leak. (laughs) And so we have to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we see throughout the Bible, God's people go dry. They consistently have times of rebellion, of laziness, of wickedness, uh, Or even, sometimes it's about too much blessing, too much peace. They become apathetic. They become self-reliant rather than relying upon God to sustain them. And they no longer thirst and hunger for his presence and his sustaining in their lives. The good news, church, is that God is always willing (laughs) to revive dry bones. God is always, and we've already heard it this morning, we've, we've heard it a couple of times actually, in communion and, and in the word that was given, in the songs that were chosen. We have heard that God is a good God and he's always willing to give us living water. So the best illustration of this that I love is from the book of Ezekiel. Uh, it's the prophet Ezekiel and God shows him a literal pile of dead bones. So it's Ezekiel 37, 1 to 4, and I'm going to read from the NIV. I don't have it um, up, but you're welcome to read along. Ezekiel 37, 1 to 14. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And this is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and, I, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. And then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise. It was a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come breath from the four winds. And breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and they stood on their feet, a vast army. And God then goes on to explain to Ezekiel what all of this means, what this vision means. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel, God's people. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel and they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people... I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live 
and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. So in that passage, church, the, um, the big problem is identified there by God himself. He says, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel, and they say that our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. And this is the greatest problem, isn't it, church, of being spiritually dry? It's hopelessness. The biggest problem of being spiritually dry is that that's what it creates. It creates hopelessness. We begin to pull back from God and we begin to isolate ourselves from him and from God's other people. We do it subtly in our hearts. We get drier and more hopeless and we pull away from him and from his people. We stop believing in his goodness and in his promises. We stop believing that anything can change our circumstances. We start to think that we are cut off. We may go through the motions of regular church life. We may say the right things. We may do the right things. But inside, we are shriveling up. Our spirit is dying. Inside is a growing feeling of dread, of despair, and a belief that we are cut off completely from God. And that faithlessness makes our bones dry, and then it makes our bones dead. But there are always two people, uh, even when we try to, you know, be a good actor, there's always two people that we will never fool. First one, of course, is God. Uh, (laughs) no matter how good we are at acting, we will never, ever fool God. Uh, He always looks straight to our hearts. Even when we're fooling ourselves, we will never fool God. He always knows, right from the beginning, um, the state of our heart. Real desire, real need, isn't something that can be faked. Uh, God knows those who are truly thirsty for him. He knows when, when it's real. Um, I loved Gordon's testimony last week um, of his, like when he was filled with the Spirit. And it was like he was so hungry for God that God met him in that place and then they couldn't shut him up. (laughs) It was like literally he was so hungry he was overflowing and it was impossible to contain. The second person, though, that we will never really ever fool is ourselves. We might fool ourselves at the beginning. Uh, We may spend weeks or months or even years uh, being in a place of fooling others uh, and trying to fool ourselves, but eventually that charade will fall away, won't it? The mask will drop, the emptiness will be overwhelming, uh, and that emptiness will no longer be there to to create that, um, that image that we're portraying. I've seen it, I've I've had so many friends I've seen go through this process where they become dry, they keep attending church, you know there's something going on, but eventually they just fall away. And then it's like they're so dry and so hopeless, some of them haven't yet made their way back. Maybe, hopefully maybe, some of us are actually in a place where we're not thirsty, uh, where we're not dehydrated. We are thirsty for God, but we're not dehydrated. It's, I hope that there's some of us here today who are actually, you are full and you are overflowing, and that is a great place to be. It's not that we can't be in that place. Um, I don't want to discourage all of us. <laughs> um, some of us, it's, that's the place we should be and we can live. We don't, all of us, live there all the time. That's the truth, you know? And so that's why it's so important to be part of a church. That's why it's so important to be a part of a body of believers, to have others around you who aren't dehydrated (laughs) so that they can be the prophet for you to prophesy to your dry bones. That's why we need to be a part of a church community. Uh, And that's the job of us when we are full, to not judge anyone, but to speak life 
into dry bones. Amen? We're going to watch a video clip. It, actually, it goes for 10 minutes, but please persevere, uh, and I won't be too much longer after that. But it's a, um, so it's a pastor talking about another pastor, um, and then we'll listen to that guy. His name is Dwayne Miller, and he was in a place of deep spiritual dryness. He was also trying to hide it as best he could. And then God meets him while he's preaching a sermon. <laughs> God meets him, and we're going to listen to that sermon as well, uh, to that part, when God meets him in this place of desperate dryness. Uh, so I'll continue to talk about it after. Um, but if we can play that video now, thanks, Meryl. I want to tell you a story about a guy named Dwayne. <coughs> Dwayne was a pastor in Texas and called by God and a great Bible teacher and a Bible preacher and it was one weekend he got sick and he caught a flu like sometimes we catch a little just an average flu, flu virus. Well he got up to preach that morning and as he did every week and he preached the first service, they had two services on Sunday morning and he wasn't feeling that great, his voice was a little bit kind of feeling rough but he preached and and they went ahead and preached the second service and was feeling a little bit worse. They had an evening service that night, and he told the, the leaders, he said, I, just, I can't preach tonight. I'm just, my voice is just gone, and I don't, I don't know what's going on. And well, what ended up happening was he, this flu virus attacked his vocal cords. It was a very unusual thing. The doctors couldn't even quite figure it out. It, it, it damaged the nerve tissue of his vocal cords beyond repair. Over the next three years, he went to 63 specialists and their teams, over 200 doctors, as they tried to diagnose him and treat him. His voice, he said, it, it felt like the worst case of laryngitis. He said, it felt like somebody choking you, like just pressing up against your vocal cords, like this pre nonstop pressure against your throat. A year after he was experienced this flu virus, he had to step down from his church. And that's what he felt called to do. I mean, as you know, as a pastor, our voice is kind of important, right? I only do two or three things, and one of which is preach. And I cast vision, and I lead. I preach, lead, and cast vision as the shepherd. And you need a voice. It helps. He didn't have a voice. So after a year, on his own willingness, he said, I, 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 this church needs to find a new pastor. I just, I, I don't know what's going on. He was devastated. His family moved down to Houston. His wife got a job because it, it took him a while to figure out what to do. His whole life he'd been trained for ministry and prepared for ministry, and, and now he, he can't do that. He doesn't even have a voice. He can't even talk. He did eventually find a job, but just went through some struggles, depression, discouragement. You can imagine. Pastors are human just like you. Yeah. Finally, they, they got, became a part of this large church in Houston, Texas, a large Baptist church. And it was one Sunday that the, the Sunday school teacher, the Bible study teacher, wasn't able to go because he was sick wasn't able to teach, so they, they asked Dwayne, of course, they, they knew that he was discouraged and maybe thought maybe they could, you know, be encouragement to have him teach, and so they asked him to be the substitute teacher, and he's like, I, I can't, I can't teach, I mean, the, the, you don't, you don't want to listen to this voice, and so they hooked him up with this microphone, the special microphone, where, where they could, you could just barely hear what he was saying and, and understand it just a little bit, and that Sunday, as he was teaching in a Southern Baptist church in Houston, Texas, it was the only Bible study class on the entire in the entire church that actually would would audio tape the lesson because with with it being a large class of over 150 people, there might be one or two that weren't there, so they would make they would tape it and then give it to people who were who were absent or who weren't there. Had two or three tapes laying on the table each week for people who maybe missed the previous week. So they recorded it. It just so happened 
that the lesson that was lined up, this curriculum that was lined up, even by the denomination, it came on Psalm 103. He begins to teach. And of course, he, he's trying to explain the fact that, that God doesn't heal all the time. Of course, here he is with this voice, and so he's, he's saying, uh, you know, God forgives all our sins, but he doesn't always heal our diseases. And I want you to listen to this audio tape, Pastor Dwayne Miller. So when the psalmist writes, and he heals all my diseases, let us say to you that I believe God still heals. And that's an ember. That is not an ember. Now you have to be careful on how you do this. Because there are folks who carry things to an excess, and it becomes a show. And God has never intended that that be what it is. God heals in His sovereign will. I don't know why God does things that He does, but I know that He does. And the only thing He requires of me is to allow Him to be God, and me to be me, and let it be. To say that, every single person will always be healed because Jesus died on the cross is a misinterpretation of scripture. Not true. Won't work. Isaiah 53 doesn't talk about physical healing. I'm sorry. That's just not the context. And to depress that there causes a misinterpretation of scripture. That's wrong. On the other hand, to say that, since we don't have anything after the book of Acts, that miracles ended at the book of Acts and they never happen again is equally as wrong. Because you have put God in the box both ways. And he doesn't want to be in the box. So the psalmist says, I'm excited, bless the Lord, and I saw one of his benefits is he heals all of my diseases. And then verse 4 he says, and he redeems my life from the pit. Now I like that verse just a whole lot. I have had, and you have had in times past, pit experiences. We've both had, we've had our times when our life seemed to be in a pit, in a grave. And we didn't have an answer for the pit we found ourselves in. I don't understand this right now. I am doing everything I can to have it. I'm not quite sure what to say or do. Oh, this is love for those 
So has the justice for the rest, so far as we believe our transgressions from us. Whenever he said the word pit, he later explained, he said the word pit, all of a sudden that pressure that he'd felt on his throat, all of a sudden was released. And his voice came back. And then he was able to get back into ministry and get back into the pastoring. And he even later traveled the country, wrote a book on his on what God did and shared that with others. You know, there's something powerful whenever we see a miracle. And I was thinking about it this morning. I think that the most powerful thing is certainly he was blessed, but now I think other people, that our faith rises up within us. Well, if God could do that for him, maybe he could do that for me. It's a little embarrassing doing a sermon about God not always healing and God healing you in the middle of it. <laughs> um, I want to tell you two more things about that story. Uh, so what happened is he was like that for three years. He couldn't speak for three years. He had that croaky voice and he had this, this pinching on his windpipe. And he had been to all of these doctors, including his, his key doctor was the head of the ears, nose and throat department of Baylor Hospital. And so it's like the, the expert in this. That was his main doctor because he was such an oddity. Nobody could understand what had gone wrong. But... They'd done all of these tests, and so they had three years of um, x-rays on his throat, of MRIs and things on his throat. And so what happened is he, he was healed, and he rang and said, I need to come and see the doctor. And it was funny because the receptionist, he said, this is Dwayne Miller. And she said, no, it's not. <laughs> she didn't recognize his actual real voice. And so then he convinced that it was him, and he needed to see the doctor, and the doctor saw him straight away, and they did some more tests. They did more examining of this. And the doctor said to him, he said, Dwayne, you know, I could have reasoned away the reason your voice came back. Like, I could have given you other reasons why you're able to speak now and discounted the miracle of it. He said, but I needed to show you this. And so he showed him three years of these, of these x-rays that showed three years of scar tissue building up in his throat. And this doctor said, now I need to show you this. There's nothing. It's gone. There's no scar tissue. And he's the head. This is like one of the best doctors in the world, perplexed, because he says this is impossible. It's, it doesn't happen. Scar tissue is, by nature, scar tissue. It's tissue that doesn't rejuvenate. It's dead. <laughs> it's dead tissue. And I can show you all of these x-rays that show it building up, and now you have none of it. You have a completely new throat. The, the head of Bala telling him that this is a confirmed miracle. Not that he didn't believe that, but this doctor was evidencing it. Um, that's the first thing I wanted to share with you, church. The second thing I want to share with you is a bit more of his story. And I encourage you, Dwayne Miller, just Google him and, and listen to him um, preaching. Because he really was in the pit of despair. He'd lost his voice. He'd lost his income. Uh, he was just hitting every battle after every battle, and his circumstance had kept getting worse. He preached that. <laughs> he preached that sermon on a Sunday morning. And God, God met him there on a Sunday morning. Two days earlier on Friday, he'd spent four hours with a loaded shotgun in his mouth, wrestling with taking his own life on the Friday. And on the Sunday, God met him and has blessed us. And he says that as he tells his whole testimony, including the aspect of the shotgun, of, of wanting, of being in such despair, of being in such hopelessness that he just wanted to kill himself. He says when he tells that whole story, sometimes some of the Christians say, oh, you can't tell that part because it's not good 
to say that a pastor <laughs> was in that place. It's not good to say that. And he says, no, he's come to realize actually that's the whole reason he wants to tell it. Because he was in that place of absolute despair. He was hiding it from everyone. He was preaching on the Sunday. And God met him in that place. In that absolute place of despair. And so his message is, if you're in a place of despair, you just keep going. You just keep going because God will meet you. Just hold on a couple more days, a couple more weeks, a couple more months. Stay there. Hold on. We have a God who does the impossible. We have a God who heals dry bones. Now that I've upset Debbie and Marie suitably enough, can I get them to come back up? <laughs> and I'm going to ask them to sing. <laughs> What a blessing that story is, church, isn't it? Of Dwayne, Dwayne Miller. So I've been wrestling back and forwards, how do we respond this morning? Um, I was going to have an altar call and anyone who wanted to come up, but I'm not actually going to do that this morning. I just felt like before I was preaching, I felt like God said to do something different. Um, as the ladies sing uh, two songs, the Dry Bones song and another song, um, I'm just, we're just going to allow God to minister to us in our seats, where we, where we are, um, just like with communion. But if in that time you want to share with the rest of us what God is doing, maybe that won't happen, but I just felt like that's what I wanted to put on the table this morning. If during this time you have a moment and an encounter with God and you want to share with the rest of us, just, just put your hand up and I'll bring the microphone to you and you can just share, even, even if it's ever so brief. So I'll just say this little bit and then I'll hand over to, to Debbie and Marie. The question is, or the thing before us this morning, church, is if you are spiritually dry, don't listen to the despair that tells you that all hope is gone. Don't, don't listen to that voice. Don't listen to that voice that tells you you're cut off from God. You have to just really silence that voice. Uh, but don't also, don't fake it. Don't pretend. Don't say you're not dry inside if you know that you really are. Instead, what we need to do is be honest we need to be real and we need to put our trust in God. We need to say uh, to ourselves, yeah, I am in a dry place, but I know that God can meet me in that place. I know that God is the one who will provide the living water. I know that I can be revived and I just have to stay the course. I just have to stay in that place until God meets me there. That's what we need to say. We need to prophesy to the wind. Come breath. Come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that we may live. And it's not, a, it's not a thing to be chasing after this morning, church. It's an offer that God is making to us. Even if it's just a little beginning today, I just know that God is reviving us in this season. So I'll just hand over to, to Debbie and Marie. Sing along or just stay in that place of surrender to God. But if you do want to share what God is doing with you, just put your hand up and I'll, I'll bring the microphone to you. Amen. Through the eyes of men seems there's so much we have lost as we look down the road where all the prodigals have walked one by one the enemy has whispered lies and led them off as slaves but we know that you God, yours is the victory. We know there is more to come that we may not yet see. So with the faith you've given us, we step into the valley unafraid. Yeah. As we call out to 
God now. 